what I'm doing today is um, there's a bunch of things I thought I could talk about, but they all feel like they need background because they just jump straight into this whole idea of content address um, storage, content addressing of data. And I just don't think that that's a generally understood concept in our industry um, like it should be. So I figure the best way to deal with that is to back right up to the beginning and just talk about the basics. And I know a lot of people in here, this is going to be um, really basic stuff. This is nothing fancy. This is not mad science. This is really basic stuff. So I'm just trying to cover some introductory stuff. But um, yeah, I'd love to get some feedback as we go. If there's uh, questions coming in, um, feel free to interrupt me uh, for us if they come in live or anyone else in the who's watching in the in the room. Um, but yeah, let's get into it and look at content addressing and data structures and how these things fit together. Okay, content addressing. Um, what is it? Well, the, the content addressing basically means the address of a piece of content is derived from the content itself. Um, and it's typically a hash digest. So you take the content, uh, which is some random array of bytes, you know, whatever it could be, it could be text or it could be um, something else, video. You run it through a hash function and that from that you derive your address. Um, so common examples of that, we're all used to Git. Um, Git is a SHA-1 of a change set to your repository. Um, and so the Git commit address or the hash is the SHA-1. Uh, in Bitcoin, uh, the hash function used is a double SHA-2256 over the 80-byte header of a Bitcoin um, block. So we, um, we're used to seeing these Bitcoin um, hashes thrown around. That's what that is. So that's the address and the content is this other thing that you can refer to. So why would you do that? Uh, so there's a number of reasons. And the main ones are, first of all, it's secure because... Uh, what it gives you is authentication, automatic authentication built into the addressing. So the address authenticates the content. So therefore I can trust, I don't I don't even need to trust you if you're giving me the content that I've asked for by the address. If I say I've got this hash and it addresses a Bitcoin block, can you give me the, the data? If I know how to uh, run the hash function, then I can authenticate the data is what I asked for. So you get this free authentication that comes with it. Uh, it's immutable can't change. You, I, I don't have to worry that um, I've got a, a, a news website and um, you know the, I give it. I give the address to someone else to have a look at uh, some, some news article and they go there and the news article is completely changed. Uh, it's, you know, I, I, I know that the address will always give the same thing. And if I need to refer to a new version of it, I need a new address. And the other thing that's a little bit more subtle is you get deduplication. Uh, so because the hash function will output the same address for the same data, you get to, there's a lot of places where you get to say, I don't need to store or refer to this same thing again, because I already have it, or it's the same as something that already exists. Um, I, I won't go into that more, but it might come out in some of the later discussion. Another term that you hear in this space is Merkle trees. Um, Merkle, the Merkle trees comes from the guy that uh, coined it, Ralph Merkle. Uh, it came from a patent in uh, 1979. Uh, and a Merkle tree basically says that the content being hashed may also contain hash digests of other content. So therefore any content address which authenticates content, which is, uh, it automatically authent authenticates content which is linked via the inclusion of their digest in the tree below it. So if you look at the, the little figure from the patent, you'll see um, down the bottom, you've got some uh, raw data, then you're hashing chunks of it. And then you're appending hash digests together and then hashing those and passing that all the way up in this binary tree to the top where you've got one hash. Um, and then that hash authenticates each of those chunks individually uh, as being part of the hash. Now, uh, so a hash tree, a Merkle trees are also known as authentication trees, hash trees. And you'll see later that this extends all the way to the concept of a, a blockchain. It's important to note here that a Merkle tree isn't strictly, doesn't strictly refer to this um, prepending, uh, appending of hashes together. Uh, a Merkle tree is simply the inclusion of a hash in some data. So it's just by linking to including a hash in your content and then hashing that, you're creating a Merkle tree. So 
Um, they don't have to be this strict binary form. They don't have to be just include hashes in these intermediate nodes. Um, but you will often see this pattern as we'll, as we'll get into some examples. Another term, uh, and this is this came up a, a few weeks ago when Michael did his talk on uh, on ZDAG, his um, block format. Um, DAG, directed acyclic graph. Uh, this is from uh, directly from graph theory. It's not specifically about content addressing, but we apply it. What it means is um, a DAG is uh, is directed, which means that the linkages between the nodes flow in a particular direction. So in in non-directed graphs, there's no directionality to the linkages, but in the, in a DAG, there's an, there's a directionality. Um, and acyclic means that there can be no cycles in the graph. So it, the, the, the linkages flow one way and there's no loops. And we can see that a Merkle tree or these Merkle structures, they're DAGs because a hash function is directional. You, there is a, you can't reverse a hash function. Um, that's one of the points of them. So you ha the hash of the data points to the data. There's a directionality. And there's no cycles. You can't uh, link to um, content that doesn't already exist. So um, you, can't, you can't create a hash for something that you don't already have. So you, there's this time component to it as well. So um, a Merkle tree is sometimes called a Merkle DAG. Uh, these terms are often mixed up together. Let's look at um, how you might use this practically. Uh, a good example is that you'll see in the wild a lot is file systems. And this is, uh, you'll see this in IPFS. And um, I'll show you another example um, straight after this as well of where it's used. Uh, but let's say we want to build a file system of distributed chunks. And let's say I my files are these distributed pieces and I've got eight files here. And I hash all of the files and I get the little addresses for them. Then I include those addresses, these little hash digests, in these directory chunks. And the directory might contain names of files. It might contain the name of the directory itself. Um, whatever it is, it's just some, some kind of blob of data that has those hashes in it, as well as some other metadata that identifies a, as a directory. And in this example, I've got a, a directory one is pointing to directory two, which is also pointing to files. So I've got a multi-level directory structure here. Um, so everything in this graph gets a address or a link. Um, so there's 10 pieces here. There's eight files and two directories. Um, and you can point to any of them individually as well. You don't just have to point to the directories. You could just pull out a file and you've got a, a link to that as well because they've, they've all got their own addresses. Here's one way where that structure is used. It's used in Git. Um, and Git adds this extra layer of these commits above it. These commits are data structures that it layers on top of files. So, and, and Git is a Merkle DAG as well. It's, it's got the same things going on. It uses SHA-1 addresses and everything in here has a SHA-1. Um, this is a very simplified version of Git, by the way. But down the bottom, we've got these blobs, which are generally files in our Git repository. And they bubble up into trees. And trees can also point to other trees. Um, so, and that, then you get your directory structure essentially. And then the trees, those things are hashed as well, and they they put into these commits, which we where we get our little um, commit strings from. And the commit contains the author, the committer, timestamps, the message, uh, and then it it points to the tree data, but it also points to this parent, which is the previous commit that you're building on top of. So you build this directional graph, and everything's hashed. So it's Merkle DAG. Uh, and in this exa is this example, um, starting from the right hand side. That's a, an original commit. There's four files in a in a, just a plain Git repo. Next commit uh, introduces two more files, but it still refers to the original four. The, then the next commit uh, introduces a directory structure. It removes files. It adds new ones, um, and it makes the Git repository more complicated. But each of these things again has their own SHA-1 address. Uh, this is a Merkle DAG. There's directionality. This is what we're talking about with content addressing. Another example is a blockchain. Bitcoin, in particular, is an easy one to, to talk about because it's uh, so many. So many blockchains are just forks of this code, and they use the same structure. Ethereum's a different beast, and some of the newer blockchains are as well. But this is this is a simplified version of Bitcoin. Uh, a, when Bitcoin first or block, they actually refer to this data structure that contains multiple independently hashed things. Um, the thing that you where you have a Bitcoin block address is actually a, the hash of a header, 80 bytes of header. In that header, 
there's also there's a hash inclusion that points to this thing called a TX Merkle root. And that is this binary Merkle tree, like we saw in the in the Merkle patent, where it's actually just appending hashes together to form this strict binary tree. And at the at the leaves of this are hashes that point to the transactions in the in the thing itself. Um, and the header also points to the previous block. And that's where we get the blockchain from. So it's the blockchain is actually headers pointing to headers all the way back to the Genesis block. And within the headers themselves, they point to their own transactions. So they're all bundled up. Um, it, one of the interesting things about Bitcoin is that this binary Merkle tree structure on the side there is actually not included in the bytes that are shipped around between um, Bitcoin nodes. Uh, they only include the transactions. Uh, and the reason for that is that they can derive that binary Merkle tree to prove that it exists. Um, so they might, in the header includes this Merkle root, but if you've got the transactions, you can generate that by regenerating this binary Merkle tree. So still, again, it's a DAG, it's a Merkle tree, same thing. Backing up to our example, the, um, uh, the directory one, this concept of a, a root is really important. A root is a single thing that you can hold on to that points to the, all of the things that you want. In this case, we've got directory one is our root. It points down to um, these nine other pieces. It can, and this one reference can, can refer to an entire graph. Um, we could also choose directory two as, two as our one reference. We could hold on to that and that's all we care about, but then we'd only get the four files underneath it. We could create a new one and hold on to that. And maybe that one points to directory two, doesn't point to directory one, that's sort of lost to us somewhere else, um, but we had two more files. Um, and we can actually include mutability in this because now what I said in the beginning that immutability was one of the, the properties of this, but um, if you include uh, mutability, um, you can, well, it's a mutability of a sort, and I'll show you what I mean by that. You, if you hold on to uh, a root that points to your data structure, um, and you keep this root as the important concept. If you change the root over time, then you get a kind of mutability. So in this example, let's say I want to change uh, file one. Maybe I edit file one and put some new bytes in it, and that changes the hash. That hash then bubbles up to the directory one blob, and that needs to change. Um, but if I just create a new directory one with a new hash, then I've got a new root, and that points to this new graph. Uh, where I've got the edited file one, but the rest are the same. Um, now, I could also hold on to the original root if I wanted to. And one of the interesting properties of that is that you get these snapshots over time that I could actually walk back in time if I had access to all of these pieces, these blobs, if they were stored in my store somewhere. Uh, mutability extends to all of the kinds of operations you could do with data structures. Let's say you've got some kind of, um, maybe this is a B tree, uh, data structure and you know, you've got some predictable layout and you want to perform some operations on it. The root is the thing I'm hanging on to and I can navigate from the root to everywhere using some specific algorithm. Let's say I want to add elements here, remove elements, um, you know, shuffle things around. Um, I can do a bunch of operations, generate a new root. And um, you can see here I've got snapshotting so I could walk back in time to the original root. Um, but I've also got um, uh, the ability to see all of the all the operations I mentioned there. I've got to add things, remove things, um, and um, what was I going to say about that? I've forgotten what I was going to say about that. It was an important point there that I that slipped my mind. But basically, um, I, I, if I've got predictable algorithms I can run across these things, I can mutate these graphs, hold on to the root. Uh, I could discard the old root and maybe garbage collect the elements that uh, I don't care about anymore. Um, that really depends on the system I'm working within. So algorithms for working with these things. Uh, so this is a this is a quite a complex area uh, because we're dealing with really complex systems, especially when we're dealing with distributed systems, because the nature of the systems come into play. So um, how do we choose or design algorithms? Well, we need to ask questions like: Is mutability needed? Do we need to be able to mutate this thing over time, or do we just want to create it up front and then ship it to the world? Maybe I have a a video file I want to package up into blocks and ship it to the world, and that's all I care about. Um, so maybe mutability is not needed, or maybe it is. Maybe I want to do a distributed uh, package manager and I want to be updated over time. So I need to ship these new routes around all the time. What does that look like? Um, so what other operations do I need to, to run um, these things? 
Um, traversal. How do I need to? How do I want to get through my graphs? Do I uh, do I need to do sorted traversal? Does it, do I need to do iteration over the whole lot, or do I just want to go to individual ones? Do I need to do size? Do I need to understand the size of these things? So, got to understand the priorities to get to these algorithms. Um, how much data should you fit into a block? These single things, things that are hashed, then that's going to be very dependent on the system because the the nature of the storage and distribution medium will impact all of these decisions. So maybe I'm using IPFS and there I've got a recommended maximum size of a meg, but uh, very commonly you'll have much smaller than a meg as well and you wanna ship these pieces around. Uh, and the size of the block will impact a whole bunch of other things. Um, this stuff's not new though. So distributed systems, you know, fairly new, but these algorithms are not new at all because persistent and immutable data structures have been around for quite a long time. And these things have been researched. We find them a lot in pro functional programming languages uh, and fun functional programming libraries that you can use in non-functional languages. Standard libraries of Scala, Clojure, Haskell, et cetera, they're all full of data structures that would translate almost directly into this world. Um, things like Hamps uh, fit directly in here and you can create distributed versions of them using the same algorithms. Um, but the algorithm selection re uh, requires careful consideration of all of the trade-offs that I mentioned as well. So there's this whack-a-mole you have to play with what, am I, what is the nature of the system I'm using and what are the kinds of operations I want to perform on it um, to figure out what algorithms you want. Am I over time for us? Should I stop here? Because I do have an example I wanted to get into. Yeah, you have time. Okay, let's, let's, I've got a few slides here just to quickly build out an example. Um, I let's say I want to build a multi-block content address um, super large array. Now, let's say I've got data that um, I want it to live in content address land, and this thing could be arbitrarily large. Perhaps it's so large I couldn't fit it in memory in my own computer. Perhaps it's so large I couldn't even fit it on my own disk. So it's going to live out there in this content addressed world, maybe on IPFS. Maybe I'm putting these blocks into S3. Maybe that's all I'm doing, but they're out there somewhere and I just want to be able to navigate through this array and store things in it. Um, now, it, I want it to be generic. Uh, the encoding form doesn't matter. Like, this could be JSON, this could be CBOR, this could be ZDAG. Um, as long as I can hash these blocks, I can use hashes as the links and I can store and load this data with hashes. So if, if I've got an operation where I can fetch by hash and I can store by hash as well, that's all I care about. Now, the leaf elements in this array, they could be anything. Maybe they're just simple integers. Maybe they're complex objects or maybe they are hashes themselves. Maybe I, I want an array of hashes because I'm building NPM. I don't know. So let's just build a super large array algorithm. This is just quickly. Um, let's start off with a block and define a maximum width. So I know how big these blocks should get up to. And um, so here I'm just, I'm using JSON here as illustration. So, so these blocks are just JSON arrays and I'm defining a width of about five, right? So um, if I store an array of four things, I can hash that. That's my root. I have a root that is single block. Great, I can now go into my block, fetch out elements from that block. That's easy. Um, and I can do it up to this maximum width, so up to five elements in my little block here. And that's simple case, one block. If I mutate that block, remove, add elements, then I get a new root address. But as you can see, if I, if I was to remove element five from that second version of the uh, array, then I should actually get back the same hash as the first version. So it's like stepping back in time, even though it performed a removal. So that's one of the nice properties of, of content addressing. Okay, so let's add more elements. What happens when we add more elements? If we go beyond the fixed width, let's add a new root that refers to the to an additional block. So overflowing our maximum width says that we have to make a new block to start storing elements in, and that new block can be up to the same width before it overflows. And then each of those blocks get, gets hashed and we store those hash addresses in a new root block. And the new root block has the same rules as well. It's got a maximum width as well of five. So let's call this a height of two now. So height at, at height level one are the actual elements. Height level two uh, is this root block that has links to the height one blocks. Now, if you think about it, you, you can see that if our height one is constrained to five elements, then at height two, um, 
we have a maximum capacity in our array of 25 elements because then we can fit five blocks of five before we overflow at our height to um, single block. But that's fine because we can overflow that as well. So there's our maximum capacity uh, height to data structure, single root block pointing to five different things. If we overflow that by adding a new element, we add a new height. And that new height refers back down to the uh, height number two. So we've got height three here that refers to height two, which refers to height one. So at, at a height of three with the five, we have this new capacity of 125 before we overflow our height. Um, so we can just keep on adding things to this thing and it goes outwards and upwards. Um, right. So traversal is interesting. So we want to say we want it. We've got this root. We've got this reference to this root and we want to traverse to index 21. Um, how do we do that? We need an algorithm that can that where we can enter in the root and then figure out where to go at each point in this graph. Uh, the algorithm's not too hard, but and there's some JavaScript to illustrate it. Basically, what you're doing is you're slicing off bits from the index at each height. Um, and to do that, we can do division and, and modulo um, operations. So if we enter, if we enter, each each node needs to know what height it's at, and it needs to know uh, how to get to child elements if it's not at the height one. So if we uh, have this root and it's height two, uh, and we say, get me index number 21, then we run this little algorithm. It says, okay, I'm not a height one, so I have child elements. I need to figure out which child element to call into. So you run, uh, you slice off some bits uh, and you say, I want uh, which child index, uh, you can run this division. Um, I'm not gonna go into the details here, but basically I, I get the index of my child element and then I get a new index to pass to that child element. So in this example, the child element would be one, uh, would be the first element, it's actually zero. And then the new index for that one would actually still be 21 because I'm not slicing off any, any bits, but um, I would pass into that, that child element and say, I want you to get me index number 21. But if I was to 26, then it would be a, a different path. So basically this is just an algorithm to traverse from the root to any node. Um, and you need more algorithms too. You need uh, things like size. If I want to know how big this thing is, there's an algorithm to get size of it. Uh, if I want to um, delete elements, there's a whole other algorithm there. Just quickly, the properties of of this array. This is this is just an example. This is not. I'm not saying this is a an array that would be good to use in every situation. This is an array that might be useful for some situations. Um, but we need to understand what the properties are uh, of the various algorithms to, uh, in order to judge whether it's useful and also how to tune it. So uh, we can see that the width means we would have larger blocks and fewer levels, which might be good. Maybe I want to have blocks up to one meg, which would mean quite large. Um, but then you can see that mutation could be expensive because I'm garbage collecting um, quite large blocks. But then I have fewer levels to navigate. Maybe I've got network latency in weighing into this as well. So there's a whole bunch of reasons you might tune that width to suit your environment. Maybe all these blocks are local, so small width is great. Um, the get and size operations are pretty efficient. They just need to traverse um, down to height one single blocks uh, and, and you can get the answers to these operations. Appending data is pretty efficient too. It only requires mutating a maximum of one node at each level. And, and there are some cases where you don't even need to do that at some levels. Um, so if you're at the boundary case, um, you, you're just adding nodes. Um, ordered iteration is really simple. It's just a left to right tree traversal. This thing just folds out into a normal tree structure and you just do left to right traversal and that's your ordered array iteration. Slicing this array is possible, but it's only efficient if you perform it at the boundaries of your width of your uh, block. So if I was to slice at boundaries of five, Great. If I was to do anything else, then I'm I'm rewriting everything to create these a new version of this thing that would fit into the new structure. Prepending data, putting it at the front, is really costly. There's the, the algorithms to do that can work out if again if you're dealing with width boundaries, but very costly because you end up rewriting everything and mutating the whole structure. Deleting elements other than at the tail is very costly as well because you're shuffling things up, rewriting, mutating data. And lastly, it can't handle sparse data. You'd have for lots of blanks and it'd be very wasteful. Uh, there's a bunch more properties to this. Um, it, we actually have a spec for this. We call it vector in IPLD. If you go to the IPLD uh, specs repo on GitHub, 
um, there's a whole write up on the various algorithms um, to traverse and mutate this data structure. Very interesting there. Uh, there's JavaScript implementation of it, and there's a Go implementation of it. You can have a look at as well if you're interested. Um, but that's all uh, I have. Hopefully, that quick example was illustrative, and I hopefully I haven't used up too much time. No, it's all good. Thanks a lot, Rod. That was amazing. Um, I uh, wish we had an applause track or something to play right now because it's it's not as it's not the same in a virtual uh, end of a talk. But uh, yeah, no, I, I also wish that you went first uh, earlier than all these other talks we had because you really laid out yeah. a lot of uh, of the basic primitives in a way that uh, makes the later the other talks easier to understand. I think a lot of times people don't. Um, well, people can jump into like the more interesting advanced stuff about whatever they've built. And if you're watching a talk like that, it can be really confusing and be, you know, it could be like, well, am I missing something here? Where's the context? And there's just not enough time in like a, in like a 15 minute talk where you're introducing like whatever, you know, Michael is introducing ZDAG and like, uh, you can't also explain what a hash function is and all, all these other things. So, yeah. um, yeah, really great introduction. Uh, thanks for doing that. That's 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 why I put this together because I was listening to Michael and also um, Macola and um, the talks about hypercore and all the rest of them. They're, they're all the same sort of things where you 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 sort of need a little bit of background at least. And I know when I started getting into this, I was I needed all this context. So hopefully that was helpful. Yeah, totally. I really Does like anyone the have diagrams. Um, I thought that the you know color coding them and then being able to go you know step slide by slide slide through these similar data structures I thought was really effective to kind of understand all the similarities. So I really appreciated that. Yeah. So uh, uh, we don't have any questions right now from the chat. We just had somebody uh, somebody mentioned that uh, that uh, it wasn't really a question, it was more of a comment that the trick of shifting a root node. Um, to another root node whenever you change one of the lower, uh, you know, the, the leaf nodes um, gives you like a fully functional data structure. And so yeah. co content addressability can really help. In, and I think you mentioned that a little bit, um, but that's super cool. Oh, and there's, there's also this the whole new field that is really, um, really going mad in, um, in the research area at the moment, which, research areas, which is these conflict free data structures. And a lot of those touch on the same kinds of areas because immutability, functional data structures, those things play into the same strengths. Um, so there's tons of research going on uh, for massively parallel computing and distributed computing that where this stuff just overlaps. There was one question in the chat that I thought would be good. Um, they were asking uh, how you, um, uh, how does index in, uh, addressing uh, still maintain the properties of the content hash addressing of immutability in this context? Because as you were describing the algorithm, it was an index which you were um, using. So could you elaborate on that particular question? Right. So in, in my example, um, I was relying on the fact that in the blobs, each of the, each of the blocks was storing an array and I could index a block. So if I load a block, and, and I use JSON there as the, as the best way to do this, because I think we all, a lot of us think in JSON when we're talking about serialization. Um, just if I store a JSON array and put that in and say, that is my block, and I'm storing that, maybe I put it on S3. If I load that, I can index into that block. Um, and at all of the height one elements, those indexes are actual uh, end elements, but I'm still only got indexes of zero to five at every block. And at the other heights, at all of my elements are addresses. And so the algorithm really is to say, if I'm coming in at the top and I know the height, how do I modify my index such that I can I know which element to look up in in this level and then which, el which element to pass on to the next level? Because you're, you're really dividing your graph as you traverse down um, and you wanna know um, how do I maintain this this index so that it gets to the right point? And what you end up with is this, this this fascinating way where the index will change through the navigation. But you as a user don't need to care about that, but the algorithm will take care of um, changing the index as it goes down through this data structure and it passes on through the nodes. Um, if, if you're interested in it, look up the spec because there's, there's some inter interesting algorithmic properties here. This is super cool. It, it's, I'm getting flashbacks to when I took operating systems in college uh, when you have a, an inode and it's like a, an, an inode number and you have to like go to the indirectly or doubly indirect block and then like go to the an indirect block and then finally find where the data is. Uh, it's, it sounds uh, like really tricky uh, bitmap that you have to like uh, debug to get it right. Yeah. 
Uh, well, this, uh, one of the talks I wanted to give was on uh, was do a talk on on hamps because hamps are really fascinating data structures here, um, and there's so much interesting math and bit shifting that goes on in that. And maybe we'll do a talk on that later. But um, same kind of thing where you you're navigating down and you're mutating these indexes and looking things up, um, and it's fascinating simple math going on. Super cool. I wish we had time for more questions, but we got to move on now to the next talk.